Thanks a lot, Meredith. Um, I'm really glad that all of you were able to join me this afternoon. And I'm excited to present about public relations. Um, so this might come as no surprise to you, but communication skills are becoming increasingly valuable in all fields, including forestry. Some of you who are educators and businessmen and women uh, will probably already understand the value of these kinds of communication skills. So this is old news to you. And then there are some of you, and don't be ashamed if this is you, there are some of you who are tree people instead of people people. Um, you'd rather be hanging in a tree sawing off branches instead of talking to the big scary public. So this presentation is for all listeners, for people who already know the basics. This will be a refresher course with a few new ideas. And for those of you who are in uncharted and unfamiliar territory, I hope I can demystify uh, the process of opening up to the public and sharing what you have to share. So I'll go ahead and get started. So let's, um, like Meredith said, I graduated from Utah State with a degree in journalism. And one thing that they, uh, the journalism, journalism professors talk about a lot is the five W's and the H of news writing and storytelling. So I'm going to uh, go through the five W's and H of what public relations is. So the first W is who. Uh, the people who are involved in public relations are you, your company, or your organization. Um, so this applies to individuals, to companies, and to organizations as a whole. Your audience is also involved. These are the people who you are trying to reach with your message. Um, they can also be called the market or the target audience. And the media is also involved in public relations. I'd like to avoid the word middleman, but it seems an appropriate uh, term to discuss. So this can refer to traditional media or newspapers uh, or radio, or it can refer to the new media, social media. <clears throat> the media can be a valid avenue between you and your audience, but it's not always necessary when you're sending a message. Sometimes you can relate to people face to face. You don't always need to go through it the media. What, what is the next part of our five W's and H? Sending a message is the essential part of public relations. Communicating something to someone. The days of one-way messaging where a company comes from the top down and presents a message to an audience, those days are over. Public relations is a two-way two street. Uh, new media allow consumers and audience to respond to messages, and a new generation of consumers will expect a response from, to their feedback. When? Public relations can occur at any time, whenever possible. Technology allows for 24 hours news feeds, updates, and so forth. But be careful, a little messaging can go a long way. Where? You have your choice of avenues for communication. You can communicate through the traditional media, such as newspapers, magazines, radio, and television. These are the news avenues that your parents and grandparents would recognize. Web media, such as uh, websites and blogs, or user-powered media like Facebook and other social media sites. Also, face-to-face -face contact. That's a little old-fashioned these days, but I think it's still the most effective way to communicate a message. It's great for you and the user, but it's not always practical due to distance and other factors. And why do public relations? PR is vital for the success of your venture. If it's a planting project or 
the latest bit of news about a promising new cultivar, an educational campaign, or an Arbor Day event. If you don't get the message out about your, about your uh, event, who will? And how. This is the H in the five W's and H. So stay tuned for that. I hope to kind of uh, let you know a little bit about how to practice public, public relations. So the essentials of public relations, you want to develop a communications plan. And uh, these are the four M's of PR, your message, your market, your medium, and your measurability. Let's start talking about message. Your message is the piece or pieces of information that you want to convey. It could be an event announcement or a news article or a mission statement or a brand statement. It could be a, an educational campaign. So up here on the screen you can see I have a couple of examples. The event announcement, the news article, mission statement, or a campaign against tree topping. These are all examples of what a message is. And one thing that's important when you're communicating to the public, whatever your message is, make it a story. Make it interesting and engaging to the public. Storytelling. OK, so we, I've set up a, a little false environmental nonprofit for the purposes of explaining how to tell a story with your message. And we're going to be using this example throughout the rest of the presentation as well. So your, let's say that you are the communications director for a Utah-based environmental nonprofit. And you're planning an Arbor Day planting event at a Salt Lake City Park on April 27th, Arbor Day. And you want the event to be open to all ages, but you especially want people high schoolers from a Salt Lake City high school to be involved. So with those in mind, I'm going to present two messages and one of them one of them is all facts and no flair, just the basic information. And the other one, the one on the right, tells a story and engages the reader. It uses action verbs, has a call to action at the end while it presents the facts. The next M is market your audience or your consumers. So when you're trying to define who your audience is, consider a couple of factors. Consider demographics. What kind of people will use your service or will benefit from your message? Are the people you're trying to reach of a certain age? Are they homeowners? Do they have a certain level of income? Are they from a certain area, geography? Are they close by to your actual physical, physical location? Are they far away? Are they rural? Are they urban? And what kind of, um, you might want to consider what kind of climate issues are, are taken into consideration. Um, if they're in St. George, different trees will do better there than in northern Utah. And your role in your message. Your message, whatever it is, will determine who your audience is. If you're a tree care business person, a professional arborist, your market will probably be different than that of a state agency. State agencies seek to serve the public in a public service sector. So with our previous example, Utah Urban Replant, um, I'd like to take a second and define the nonprofit's market or audience. So since they're planning their event for a Salt Lake City Park, we'll definitely want to consider Salt Lake City residents part of the audience, neighbors close by to the park, people who would be considered green enthusiasts, those who are already interested in trees, planting, 
outdoor nature events. Families, all are invited to this event, and what's a better way to teach your children about the importance of trees than to bring them to an Arbor Day planting event? And then high school students from this fictional Utah high school. And local service organizations, such as the Boy Scouts or church groups. All of these people, all of these groups, are examples of the market that Utah Urban Replant would want to reach based on their message. A medium. This is the avenue that you're going to convey your message. We have traditional media, social media, and then a more direct approach. So traditional media, this is newspapers, magazines, radio broadcasts, television spots, and other media that have been around for a while. So a couple of pros to this traditional media, newspapers and radio spots, television programs, they have a wide reach. You can talk to many, many, many people if you write an article for, say, the Salt Lake Tribune. That will reach thousands of people in northern Utah and throughout the rest of the state. And Traditional media, especially nonprofit media such as Utah Public Radio, are generally seen as trustworthy by the audience. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, messages coming from the top down that are that are seen as trustworthy by the audience. A couple of cons to the traditional media. <laughs> You no longer control your message. It's in the hands of whatever journalist has decided to pick up your story. Also, if you're considering your message as a, an advertisement, paid advertisements will not fit every budget. Let's move on to social media. Social media includes Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and hundreds of other different sites where people share media with one another. A couple of pros. It allows you to have a dialogue between you and your audience. If somebody asks you a question on Facebook, you're able to comment right back and respond and answer their question. Another pro, social media is free. There's no subscription fees, no paywalls. A couple of cons, it's not a good fit for every audience or every message. And by this I mean, if your audience is very elderly or lives in a place with poor access to internet service, using social media doesn't work out as well. Another con, maintenance of your social media sites can take up quite a bit of time. If you post just one thing per month on Facebook, that's not going to impress any of your audience. It's best to find a balance between ultra-frequent posting and posting that's so infrequent that people check out of your page and never pay attention to you again. So I would recommend trying to post one thing, one article, one event, one picture per week while you're starting out. and then aim for a post per day or every two days once you've gotten the hang of it. A direct approach. So I consider this to include website content as well as face-to-face -face interaction and printed materials that you can hand out to your audience. Again, this can present a dialogue between you, the message maker, and your audience especially if you're face-to-face. -face. Or on a website or blog post, people can also leave comments and you can respond to them. Again, you control the messaging. You're the one who decides what you're going to say and how it's said. Your message isn't filtered through the eyes of a reporter. And 
You can present your message in more than 140 characters, which is the character limit on Twitter. And websites and blogs are a good way for you to directly publish research, articles, photos, anything you want. A few cons. Face-to-face -face interaction can be difficult to accomplish due to geography, cost, uh, human resources problems, and your reach is not as broad. The people who are interested in what you have to say are already aware that you exist. You probably won't get a lot of new uh, people who have never heard of your organization by using a direct approach. So again, in light of our, our urban replant example, and considering their audience, let's take a look at the media that the organization can use. As far as traditional media, we'll want to talk to people in Salt Lake City. Uh, and the media in Salt Lake City, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but we have the Salt Lake Tribune, the Deseret News, KSL TV, radio stations, and Edible Wasatch Magazine, which is a specialty magazine that's geared towards a sort of green crowd, and the student newspaper at Utah High School for the high school audience. As far as social media, Utah Urban Replant can post on their Facebook page, they can create an event page, they can Twitter, and direct methods. We're assuming that this Utah Urban Replant has a web page and a blog, so they can post on their blog, they can make an event announcement on their web page, and they can get in touch with various organizations throughout the state that run events calendars like Utah State University Extension and Utah Public Radio and Tree Utah as well as local newspapers. We were talking about measurability, goal setting, and quantifying your success so that you can set some measurable goals so you can measure whether or not you did well or you did poorly. So with our Utah Urban Replant example, they could set some goals like publish their announcement in three local newspapers. Three is a quantifiable number. They will know right off the bat if they have accomplished that or if they have not. They, another goal that they can set, they can say that they want their Facebook post to be liked by more than five of their Facebook fans. Another, again, another measurable number. And so after your event or after your media campaign, you'll want to analyze your reach and results afterwards. You can check your website analytics to find out who came to your page, what they clicked on, how long they stayed. Or you can send out an email survey to your participants and gauge what they learned, who they are, and then you can use your results to determine how to proceed from there. And so this, this picture is reminding me that I, I'm going to take a break from our hypothetical situations and talk about a couple of real life examples of public relations in action. So believe it or not, you're in the midst of a public relations campaign at this very moment. This is a public relations campaign that Meredith and I accomplished. So let's talk about our message. The message was, Join us for the February Learn at Lunch webinar where I will talk about engaging the public with the people part of forestry. Another part of our message, the date, the time, the place, the how-to. We tried our best to make it a story by making the summary of the event an enthusiastic and engaging piece of writing. So our market I'm sorry to say, I focused mainly on Utah. I had no idea that there would be some people from outside of the state attending. So our market is urban foresters, extension educators, state agents, arborists, and a few people who might just happen upon this webinar and decide to log in. 
I learned who my market was from doing a couple of other webinars with other hosts. We've gauged who we have reached in the past and sent out email invitations to those who have been interested in these webinars in the past. The media that I used, I used the USU extension calendar, the forestry extension calendar, email list serves, I created a Facebook event, I made two Facebook posts, but judging by your poll responses, it seems like most of you have responded to the email list serves and are here because of those. So I might need to work a little bit on my Facebook posting so I can attract more Facebook viewers to this kind of webinar. And the way I'm measuring this, I did a couple of polls at the beginning of the webcast. We might send out a survey afterwards. And my goals are to maintain attendance at the same level as past webcasts. And another goal to inspire at least two questions from the audience. So I'm counting on you, audience, to help me out with that. And at this point, I'm going to switch over and show you my screen so that I can show you one of my favorite examples of good PR that's done by people who are not PR professionals. So if you'll bear with me for just a moment while I switch over and share my screen. All right, I hope that's up and ready to go. If you are looking at my screen right now, you'll see that I'm at the Division of Wildlife Resources site, the Utah DWR. And I love this website. I think this website is a great example of lots and lots and lots of PR campaigns, lots of great messages, and uh, an organization that's really engaged with their public. So I'm going to click on this aspect of their page. Sorry, this is not working out so well. Well, as you can see, we've got great messages. Ice fishing, cold weather means hot fishing. Now that is a story. That's a message with a story. So, I'm going to take you to their wildlife blog. Again, this is another great example of stories that are being told by people who are not necessarily communications experts. I'll take you to one specific story that I thought was really wonderful. A good example. This is by a conservation officer with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. And he tells a story about preventing poaching. And it's engaging. There are photos. And it's got a great message. Stop poachers. So I'll take you back to the main page. And we're going to take a look at the Division of Wildlife Resources social media use. We'll go to their Facebook page first. and. In my opinion, the DWR does social media right. They have a wonderful Facebook page. All of the things that should be present in a Facebook page are here. There are photos. There are contests. Right here we have a winter fishing photo contest in exchange for a free hat. That will probably drum up a lot of interest, both for people who would like to show off their large fish and also people who are in the market for a free hat. Uh, they're showing links to other articles put on by other news sources. We have right here the KSL Outdoors show talking about the burbot bash. So their Facebook page is just one of the most popular. And you can see it's popular. 3,820 people like their Facebook page, which is Pretty impressive. We'll go back to their main site and go over to their YouTube page. Another thing that the DWR does right, they produce some great multimedia. They have many, many videos, and all of them, all of the ones that I have watched at least, have been exciting and educational without being too boring or didactic. They're just really, they do such a good job. <laughs> And one other thing, this is kind of a kind of a an odd new 
social media site, especially for the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. They're on Pinterest, which is another social media sharing site generally thought of as a place for people to share craft information, recipe information. But they're using it to share pictures, crafts for kids, wildlife-inspired decor, and wild game recipes, as well as events. If I'm clicking on this bald eagle event right here, and it takes me to a very visual layout for all of their events that they've had in the past and upcoming events. We've got the flying tundra swans, snow geese, bald eagles, archery. Really fantastic. So the Division of Wildlife Resources is all around a really, really wonderful website. And I, I cannot praise them enough. For the next part of this presentation, I am going to show you how to create a Facebook page for your organization or your company. And I'm going to continue going running with the Utah Urban Replant Organization. So if you just go to Facebook, you can come down to the bottom here and see where it says create a page. First of all, you'll have to have a personal account, um, but you don't need to post in your personal account very often. You don't need to put up any of your personal information. You just need a starting point from which you can create a page. So for Utah Urban Replant, I'll select a community organization or institution. And I'm not sure how well you can see this, but you can choose a category. And there are many, many categories. Energy, uh, engineering, industrials, legal and law, um, and a government organization. I'm going to call mine nonprofit organization. And the company name, I'll type in Utah urban replant. And we'll get started. And it's going to take me to a new page where you're going to upload your profile picture. And I've got a couple of photos ready and waiting. We've got this lovely magnolia picture for our profile picture. It's loaded up there. Hit next. And then this is where you just kind of provide some basic information about your page. So Utah Urban Replant, we'll talk about how it's a nonprofit and it seeks to plant trees in urban Utah. And we can link to their non-existent web page. This question right here, will this page represent a real organization, school, or government? My answer is no. But if you're creating this for a real organization, your answer will be yes. You can customize your URL so it's easy for people to find. Right now the URL says facebook.com slash Utah Urban Replant. I think this is a really great idea so that your URL is easy to type in. It's not just a string of numbers and letters. And to enable ads, I've, I've never really um, done a Facebook ad before. However, Advertising on your page can grow your audience and can be successful. So we go along to create the Utah Urban Replant page. And it's, it's asking me to share things and just kind of giving me a tour around the page. And this is basically what your uh, brand new Facebook page will look like. What you'll want to do first is invite some people you know to start liking you or start advertising, hey, we have a Facebook page. You should like it. Um, 
you can start adding photos, you can start writing something, like Utah Urban Replant is going to be doing a Arbor Day Planting Foundation celebration. Um, you can add a cover photo, which is just another great visual way to attract people to your page. And so right here we are under the Build Audience tab. You can invite your email contacts. You can invite your friends, your personal Facebook friends. You can share the page to other organizations. Like in this example, maybe I would share my page with Tree Utah's Facebook page and encourage Tree Utah to like my page. Or I would encourage the Forestry Extension to like my page. And that way we kind of have some triangulation between different um, different organizations that have similar interests. And so that's about all I have presented right now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go to my contact information so that you can see that. And uh, I'm ready to take any of your questions if you have any. Have there been any questions? Come Rose, there are a couple of questions that came through. Um, one of them was, are there things specifically to avoid on Facebook, kind of troubleshooting for especially organizations and government agencies that are on the definitely do not do list? All right. Um, I can think of a couple off the top of my head. It's important that you make your Facebook posts as your organization instead of as your personal, like using your Facebook personal account versus using the Facebook account of your company. If you use your personal Facebook account um, and, and promote something that's, accidentally promote something that's inappropriate or um, could compromise your situation with your organization or with your company, um, that is definitely something I would encourage avoiding. Also, don't get into any arguments with people who are posting on your page. This might not be a problem for a lot of organizations, but on the internet, people tend to feel a little bit freer with the way they communicate. They might say some inflammatory things. It's important that you, as representative of an organization or a company or the government, don't engage with that in a negative way. And there have been a couple of examples in the news lately um, of social media backfiring on companies because their social media uh, representatives have just treated consumers disrespectfully. Great, Rose. Another question came through regarding your profile picture and what the purpose of that is, how, how important that is, what should it be. Can you go into a little bit of detail on how to pick your profile, profile picture and what that really does for your organization? Yeah, you bet. Um, the profile picture is a photo that will be associated with your page. Um, if you are using a Facebook account for personal use, it would be a picture of your face. But uh, just so people could identify the picture to the name of the person on Facebook. But for an organization, um, the profile picture can be something like a logo for your company or just a really nice kind of catchy photo that will catch people's eyes. I'll, I think maybe I'll go back and share my screen again um, so we can see the Utah State University Forestry Extension website and that'll give you an example of um, a profile picture. So I hope people can see that. Um, so right here we've got the USU Extension Forestry profile picture. It's just a picture of an oak leaf. It's it catches the eye, it's bright and colorful, and it's kind of our signature. Um, and also we've got this nice cover photo of, of a northern Utah canyon. And I always say the more, the more photos on your page, the better. Um, it, gives something, it gives your audience something visual to engage with. Let's see. I have a question here from somebody who asks, can you delete poor comments from Facebook? And the answer to that is yes. 
But I don't recommend it because your users will catch on that you're deleting comments. People will start to get involved and outcry about censorship and how their voice is not being heard. So yes, you can, but I wouldn't. And let me see if there are any other questions. We have a good recommendation from City of Seattle Heritage Tree Program um, as a good example of a Facebook page. Thank you for that recommendation. And uh, any more questions, Meredith? Oh, it looks like we have we have a comment from Andrew who says that Riverton City disabled its Facebook page because of controversial comments. And that doesn't really surprise me that much. City government and smaller um, local governments don't always allow Facebook to be used at work just because of the way that comments can get out of hand and people who are posting who have an axe to grind um, just kind of getting out of hand. I and think, so Rose, if you can go into that a little bit more in detail. Sorry to cut you off there, but I, that was a lot of the conversation in the chat pod was with the restrictions and, and how, what are some good ways to get around it or how would you go about going through your IT department or whatever to make sure that the content is approved uh, by the appropriate folks? Well, I've never had to deal with it on our own USU Forestry Extension page. I've never had to do damage control, knock on wood. Um, there may be ways on Facebook to screen comments that are coming in, but I am not sure about that, actually. Um, if, you're, if you're talking about a website or a blog or some other kind of media that's online but is not strictly a social media site, um, I know with blogs, most blogs, you can moderate comments. You can have, you can set up a setting within your blog um, so that every comment that somebody posts gets sent to a moderator, and then the moderator can say, eh, this adds to this discussion, or it doesn't. And uh, they can kind of make that determination. I think, I think as far as Facebook damage control, um, if there's something that's really been blown out of proportion, probably my recommendation would be to just lie low for a little while, let it blow over, get the facts out about, about what is correct and what is not, and then just kind of let it blow over and, and uh, hope that people don't have long memories when it comes to that sort of thing. I, I can't make any more specific recommendation than that. There was another comment that came in here talking about when speaking to the public. Um, I've got to go find it again. Clifford mentioned when speaking to the public, start with uh, start with a joke or story that sets that sets you up and um, puts those that you're speaking to at ease. Can you talk a little bit about framing some of your messaging so that it is approachable to your audience? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think that the most important thing to remember about messaging, again, is you want to tell a story. It doesn't just need to be straight facts without any kind of flourishes at all. You want your message to be interesting to the people who are hearing it. And so part of, part of making that message believable is coming across as somebody who knows what they're talking about, um, coming across as somebody who is easy talking to the public. And really, the only thing that can help you improve that is just a little bit of practice. It sounds like we have some more some more comments from people who are <laughs> really feeling strongly about this um, this Facebook negative comment item. Somebody says if you if you allow poor comments to just linger on your site and don't delete it, won't that be worse? And I think in some cases 
it would be, and in some cases it wouldn't. Um, you definitely don't want to make the situation worse by responding uh, in a, an outraged manner or in a manner that's going to offend your audience. Um, and for some people, censorship of their public comments is a major offense. And so I still wouldn't recommend deleting comments. Um, I can I can put in a link here to uh, an example about um, a social media debacle that happened, and uh, and it became worse because the social media representative was deleting comments and adding new comments, and it was just kind of a a major disaster. <laughs>